a bunch more show it so so uh, wins or successes what good things have happened Snow <laughs> I know right we can actually uh, see outside for a bit that's good what else we already got our first listing all right congratulations good job is uh, what was the source on it where did it come from? Oh, well. <laughs> grandma. My grandma. That's okay. <laughs> you just say <laughs> SOI. <laughs> just say <laughs> SOI from my SOI. Yes, and yes. That's good enough. So, cool. Congrats. That's awesome. I had my first bear broker, and we had an offering on Saturday. But, and it's it's like a lot of drama, but it's a good first client because I'm learning. Nice. Yeah. Good job. That's great. Thank Congrats. you. Congrats. That's fast, so that's really, really fast. Yeah, it's awesome. <laughs> I'm still trying to get everything figured out. <laughs> well, good. Well, we're going to help you today. Thank you. So, good. Anyone else? I'll share a small one. Okay, good. Um, I went door knocking yesterday, which has been hard after later in the day I've been trying to go. Um, and it's been hard because when I get home and my fiance and my puppies, I just want to stay home. Yeah. <laughs> so, but I went and I got like three really good contacts. So, nice. Yeah. Awesome. Good job. That's yeah. Congrats. Anyway. Yeah. yeah, that's great. Cool. <laughs> Anyone else? <laughs> All right. Any questions before we get going? Then? Okay. This is going to be a talkative day, apparently. All right. So. Let me pass these out to you here. And there's two of those there. So. Are you? Awesome. Glad you did. Come on in. All right. So um, here's what we're going to do. So we're going to go through and talk about the buyer packet. So. Um, <laughs> How I want to do this, though, is we're not going to go through and read the entire thing, which uh, we could, unless you guys want to. You guys want to. <laughs> okay, so we won't do that. Then. So we're not going to read the entire thing, but what I do want to do, though, is go through and make sure that you understand it. So uh, the idea of this, uh, of, so my objective for today is to have you leaving here feeling like you have a, a decent understanding of the buyer paperwork and how to fill it out, um, how to explain it. So really what, what I felt like works the best is I want to go through this with you today. In essence, the way I would go through it as, as I'm sitting down with a buyer and explaining the buyer paperwork. So um, now keep in mind though, as we go through and we talk about this, this is not uh, everything that you would ever potentially need with a buyer, meaning like every buyer is going to have some little nuances of different things that you're going to need in addition to these. But at a minimum, um, you're going to need all of these documents with every buyer that you work with. Uh, the only exception to that is going to be the lead-based paint, which we'll talk about. You may or may not end up needing. So, um, so what I'd like to do is just go through and start talking about each section and explaining it and, and really talking about how do you fill it out, what goes on the blank lines and things like that, and then just answer whatever questions you guys have. So as you have questions about it, let's talk about it. So here's where I want to start. Is notice up at the top, right where it says exclusive buyer broker agreement and agency disclosure, right underneath that, it says this is a legally binding agreement. Read carefully before signing designated agency brokerage. So, why would we put that on here? Because they know it's a legally binding document. Like, when they sign, they sign their life for it. Okay, good. <laughs> so, to some extent, uh, what what I want you to know about that is if for some reason somebody was saying, hey, I want to have my attorney review this first, which doesn't happen very often, but if somebody were to say that, like, 
you should be okay with it because this is a legally binding agreement. Now, with that being said, let me ask you this. If that's true, this is a legally binding agreement, read carefully before signing, do we enforce it? Are we going to take somebody to court over it? So, Eric's saying yes. I'm hearing some no's, some maybe's. Attorney fees are not, are not going to be worth taking someone to court. Okay, good. So uh, here, that's what I want to have a discussion with for a minute. So even though this is saying this is a legally binding agreement, look, I'm going to give you my experience with this document. In my experience, there are very, very few times that it probably ends up that we take someone to court over the buyer-broker agreement. Now, that doesn't mean we won't or that we can't because we can, and there are times when it would make sense for us to do that. But a lot of times, actually, the enforcement of this contract is really going to boil down more to you of meaning saying, Parker, if you had, let's say you had somebody sign this, and then you came back later on saying, hey, they went and bought another house, and this agreement says that if they buy, that I'm going to be entitled to a commission. Like, I want to take them to court and get paid off that. A lot of the decision on, hey, are we going to go to court on this, is going to fall to you as to do, uh, do you want to do this. So so let's, let's run through. Let's say that Parker had somebody sign, and he shows up now saying to me, Hey, I had this client that signed it. They went and bought another house. We want to. I want to enforce it. I want to be paid a commission because they agreed that I would get paid based on this document. Great. We'll do that. The first thing that we are typically going to do is we'll have Sam Bell, our attorney, send a letter to the person saying, "You have um, violated this agreement and you owe us a commission," and see what happens. In the event that nothing happens from that, now the next step would be then us saying, okay, are we going to go to court over it? If we're going to go to court over it, this is how it works. So of everything we're going to talk about today, this may be the most important thing for you to hear from this. I mean, not probably, I'm kind of joking. but So Parker says, I want to go to court on this. What's going to happen then is we're taking a little bit of a gamble because do we know what how the court's going to rule on it? No. So... What's in essence going to happen is we're going to go spend money to try to collect a commission. Now, let's just hypothetically say that, uh, and I don't know what split Parker's on, but let's just hypothetically say that he's on a 70-30 split, okay? Which means 70% of the commission on when we collect it is going to go to Parker, 30% is going to go to the company. So if that's the, the case... Who should pay to take these people to court? Well, at least 70% of it, because if we collect... Now, see, here's the challenge, though. So I've had my license now for 23 years, and, and I'll be honest with you, for a majority of that time, too, so for probably 15 years of that, like, I kind of felt like, well the company should take them to court. Like, take them, because when somebody signs this, who owns this, th them as a client? Brokerage. Yeah, it's the broker that owns them. So I always kind of felt like, well, like if, if we're going to take them to the court, the brokerage should take them to court because it's their client. But would it make sense that, let, let I'll just make up some numbers here. Let's say that we were going to collect a $10,000 commission if we take them to court. And you're going to get seven thousand of that, and then the company's going to get three thousand of that. Like, would it make sense for the company to be like, "Yeah, let's go spend like four or five thousand dollars to try to collect this commission, so that you can get your seven thousand dollars?" Like, and I'm not trying to say like, I, what I don't want you to do is feel like I'm saying like the company doesn't care. Like, we want the commission as well, but like. It makes sense, doesn't it, to be, to be like, you're going to get 70% of the money. So if we're going to go to court, you get to pay 70% of the attorney's fees to see if we collect. I mean, does anybody have heartburn with that? Do you disagree and have a different thought process on it? I mean, 
because here's the problem. Like when we're, when we're on a split like that, when we're on a, okay, you get 70% of the commission, the company gets 30% of the commission. Like we like that idea when we're getting money. But the downside is if you're on a 70-30 split and we're going to go to court, like it, you also get the benefits of the 70-30. So it's during those times you wish that you were on the opposite. Like the company's, you know, right? So, but does that make sense? Yes. Okay. So this is a legally binding agreement that essentially, what did I just say? We're probably never going to, I mean, I shouldn't say never going to enforce, because we do, but it's pretty rare that we're going to, and so again, if you get frustrated with it and you come to me and Parker says, hey, these people went and bought a house, they signed an agreement, I want the commission, great, we'll go after it, if you want to go after it, we'll go after it, but you get to pay 70% of the attorney's fees to go do that. Now, um, any questions, thoughts on that? How often do you see that happening? That not the going to court, but the that clients buy a house without the agent that they signed oh, the agreement with. Oh, great question, actually. So, mm -hmm. I, I, what I'm about to say, do not hear it as me saying that it's okay for you to do this. But here's this is I'm going to give you reality. This. How I train you is not reality. What I mean by that is I'm going to train you the way you should do it, but I'm now going to show you the way that it happens in reality in most places, which shouldn't be the case, though. Well, because, in fact, let me ask it this way. In real estate school, what did they teach you about this, about agency? Okay, so when, when do you need to do it? The very beginning, yeah. Yeah, essentially, uh, there there is going to be a test on this information, just not today, just FYI. So next Thursday, you guys are going to get tested on this. So so remember what I'm about to say. Now I don't remember what I was going to say. <laughs> Shoot. What did you just say? Me, I didn't say About agents. Well, it has to be established. Oh, that, thank you. That was it. Okay. Yeah, it wasn't you. <laughs> so what, um, when do we need to do it? As soon as practical. There, that is exactly right. That's the answer. So as soon as practical is, is when we need to, to establish and do our agency. It's just as soon as it's practical. So as soon as possibility that we can. Okay. So, so uh, does it have to be before we show them a the house? No. Well, no. Sometimes you probably like to get maybe one house and then establish agency. If you haven't already had them come into the office and sit down with you prior to that. Okay. But most agents would probably say that we'll do one on the house, kind of, but then we need to. We're like drug dealers. The first yeah, one's first free, one's so free. we can get you addicted. Right. Right. <laughs> first one's free. So yeah. So technically, we should do it as soon as we can. Now, in our co now, the, so there's two pieces to this. On the division side of things, the division saying you need to do it as soon as possible. So as soon as possible, you should be disclosing who you represent and how all that works. On our code of ethics, though, over here, what does our code of ethics say about uh, agency and when we should do it? Any ideas? Before you start showing them houses. Okay, good, close. What it says is that you need to establish agency or ask the person, which, so let's even have that conversation for a minute, is when do you need to ask somebody if they are working with an agent? Okay, so here's what our code of ethics says. Our code of ethics says you need to ask them if they're working with another agent prior to providing a substantive service. Now, what's a substantive service? Show them the house. In parentheses on our code of ethics, it says writing an offer or presenting a CMA. So a substan so keep in mind that the, what it really is is a substantive service. 
So it could potentially be interpreted as substantive services showing in my house, but yet in parentheses it says writing an offer, which would lead me to believe Houses. Yeah, that I, I have to do it prior to, like, it's got to be substantive. What if they haven't signed anything, even though they say they're working with it? Okay, perfect. That's where, that's where, that is exactly where we're heading with it. So, in reality, less than 2.13% of the time do agents actually have somebody sign a buyer broker prior to writing an offer. Wait, you're saying, that's, I, that's why I said don't listen to this. I, remember, I said don't do it this way, but this is what happens. You're right. saying 2% of the time they don't do it, or 2% they only do it 2% They the only. Yeah, that makes sense. Most agents, less than 2% of the time, will an agent ask somebody to sign this before writing an offer. Most agents don't ask, hey, I need you to sign this buyer broker. So, like, high five that you did it right out of the gate on your. Yes. Yeah. First one. I'm so scared. I don't want to. I don't want any issues. I want them to be mine. <laughs> well, so that's just it. Now here's the challenge, though. Just because somebody has signed this, does that mean they're hers? I know that might be a little bit of a trick question, but I mean, it's does it? To be, but that's not necessarily how it reacts. Okay. So I guess technically no, but they are responsible to pay the commission. Okay. Good. So yeah, so keep in mind there's two pieces to this always. The one side of it is this is a legally binding agreement. So if they sign it, then yes, they technically they're your client, they owe you a commission. But then on the other side of it, we have something that's called procuring cause. And what does that say? Continuing sequence of events that result in the completion of a transaction or something to that effect. Okay, good. Yeah. The and, and do you remember and I know you were in my class that I taught this is the way the Arkansas Supreme Court, you remember that? How the Arkansas Supreme Court defines procuring cause? It's the squirrel that shakes the branch, not the one that gathers the nut. So there's two pieces to this. One side of it says, if you sign this with me and you go buy a house, I'm entitled to a commission. The other side of it, though, is procuring cause that says, you've got to have taken all the steps that created them buying the house in order for you really to get paid the commission. But not in an exclusive buyer agreement. So what do you mean? In an exclusive buyer agreement, you don't have to prove that you did a current cause, right? Oh, I see what you're saying. Yes. Yeah, yes. So, yeah, if, it, if we had a versus the exclusive right, or exclusive designated agency, correct. So, does that make sense? So keep in mind, as we go through and talk about this, so let me say it another way. So I serve on the Professional Standards Committee for the Salt Lake Board and the Utah Association of Realtors. There are a lot of times we end up doing these commission disputes where we're figuring out who's entitled to the commission. What we end up looking at is who was the procuring cause. Now, having this signed is a piece of procuring cause, but that doesn't mean... Uh, too many agents out in our profession feel like, well, if somebody signed this, I'm the procuring cause. I get paid the commission. But that's not necessarily true. So keep in mind, there's two pieces. So procuring cause over here is who's entitled to the commission, which is one thing. But then what does this say at the top? This is a legally binding agreement. You're agreeing if you buy a house, you owe me a commission. So really, let's say, though, let's use the example. So Parker has a person who signed this. They then go buy a house with somebody else. The first step would be going to the procuring cause of saying, okay, was he the procuring cause? And I have sat in on scenarios where the person has signed this buyer broker, but then as we looked at the scenario, it turns out the agent who had this signed actually didn't follow through on some things to get the, their client paid, and a different agent did. So we gave the money to somebody else. Now, let's say one sec. So, even though that's the case, Parker still would have a legal right to go to court and say, but you signed this and it says here, if you buy a house, I'm going to be entitled to a commission and could potentially have a judge look at it and say, yes, that's true. You do owe, now that person owes Parker a commission. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, go ahead. I lost my question. Oh, you're like me. Halfway through. <laughs> if it comes back, let me know. All right, so questions on that. Does that make sense? Okay, so now let's go. Go ahead, Barton. My question is: He's like, I want to get paid, so let me. There's a fortune in this legally binding document, 
says that the prevailing party pays attorney fees, right? So, I mean, that, so if we do go to court and we win, then our attorney fees are paid. Yep. Correct. Yep. But if you don't, yeah. and you lose, you could end up not only paying your attorney's fees, but theirs too. Right. So, does that make sense? Yeah. So, I've got one that I actually referred a client to one of our agents, and he went out, sold him a, a build job, and kind of long convoluted story. But we were considering actually taking him to court, knowing we would end up paying our portion of the attorney's fees on this, but I felt like we could really win. As I dug into it more, I noticed a few signatures missing here and there, and I started going, uh, not so sure that we could win now. So we went back trying to settle it, got the buyer to, or excuse me, the builder to agree to they would pay us half of the commission, but they still never sent it to us. So anyway, somebody else had a hand. Yeah, I was just asking. I know that Matt has had a couple of clients that like they went with another agent after like having signed the thing and made multiple offers. But he just called the other agent and was like, hey, I've been working with this client for six plus months. Uh, can you confirm the commission is not okay? Yeah, in fact, I think that's a very good idea. Like, so if you came across something like that, that is a very good idea. Because, again, I sit on professional standards. We had a scenario where we had two agents came in. The, the agent who ended up writing the deal had offered and said, Parker, I'll give you a 25% referral fee. But Parker, it wasn't really Parker, but that other agent felt like, I'm entitled to the whole thing, so forget it. We, they went to an arbitration that, that we did at the board, and at the end of it, we gave the commission to the person who wrote the offer, and the, uh, the agent who had this signed got zero. And we did say, you can take them to court. And she's like, well, I'm not going to do that. Like, I'm not going to subject the client to that. So that's my experience is usually that they don't take their client to court. So if you get this signed and you're making all the attempts to like provide amazing service, like you have text proving and all of that, they could easily just go with another agent. So is there really a point in, and I may have missed this, I can't remember nope. what I'm like, but is there really a point in even getting this signed up? So the answer is yes, absolutely, but you're landing on why most agents don't do it. The reason most agents don't do it is because to some extent, here's how I like to think of it. I think of this buyer-broker agreement as it keeps honest people honest is really what it's going to do. Because If somebody's underhanded and sneaky and they sign this, they'll still go and buy with somebody else. So like this document is only worth the integrity of the person who's signing it, if that makes sense. Well, it's so, also a mindset thing. I mean, mm -hmm. if, if you convey the document correctly to them, I mean, there's a portion in the agency relationship where you say, you know, this is a fine document that you're only going to work with me. You haven't signed a contract with anyone else. But I feel like the average person, at least that I've worked with, is going to, you know, understand what they're signing and, you know, commit to that. Yeah, and that's you're exactly right. So for me, it's it's when I say keep honest people honest. I guess to some extent, it's even just having them at least have a mindset of feeling like, well, we have already committed to this person. Versus if they haven't signed it, it might be easy to be like, well, we could justify not using them anymore. But but just know that there's two pieces. There's the legal. This is a legally binding agreement. But there's also procuring cause which would say, even though you might feel like you did everything, because the, the one I was, scenario I was just talking about, the agent felt like, I did everything right. I did every. The only thing she didn't do was the buyers had asked about a house, and she said, oh, that's out of your price range, which I would have done the exact same thing, quite honestly. I would have said, it's out of your price range. It doesn't make sense to go look at it. But the buyers then called the listing agent and said, this is what we qualify. Is there a way we could get the the home if we offered X amount of dollars and paid our very top and that listing agent then negotiated it with the seller and came to an agreement and so because of that we felt like the first agent didn't even though I wouldn't have I wouldn't I don't think she did anything wrong it was kind of just an unfortunate scenario so there are possibilities of you did everything exactly right although I guess I would argue she didn't do everything exactly right because she didn't make that one phone call to say is there any way we could get them to come down on their price. So, so on the opposite side of everything, um, let's say I go and show a couple houses to somebody, and then 
we stay in contact and all of a sudden I hear that they made an offer on a completely different house with somebody else. Am I entitled to commission if I didn't sign this or is it too late? Good question. So this is a piece of procuring cause, but in and of itself does not so I guess the, the real answer to that is it would depend on everything that happened on it, how you're going to, if you're going to or not. But here's what I would say. This is a piece of it, so having this is going to be one thing in your favor to getting the commission, either way. So like, I guess phrasing it this way, it's never going to hurt to have it. It could hurt not having it. So please know, like, I am in favor of getting this signed by your client as soon as possible of having them sign this. Because I feel like more than anything else, it's the mindset it creates in them that they're committed to working exclusively with you. So, okay, so with that, let's go through it. So, uh, the first blank line there is you're going to put in the effective date on blank day of blank month of blank year. Obviously, you're putting the, when you want it to become effective, right? And then it says that it's between Century 21 Everest Realty Group and blank, the buyer. So, what should we put there for the buyer? Now, I know that feels like, duh, but... There's a little more to it. So, like, what should we put on it? Legal format. Okay, so how are we going to know that? Like, should we say, I need to see your driver's license partner so that I can, like... Yes? Well, yes. Yes. I know. <laughs> yes. Well, because you might have, you don't know. If you don't, someone comes in and meets you, do you really know their name? Yeah, that's a very good point. And if they, and by the way, who else are, are they buying with? Are you buying this with a spouse or a partner? We need to put both those names on there. So okay, that, good. So that, okay, the husband wrote on here, but the wife went and bought the house, but they're buying it together, but the wife wasn't on here. Just like that. So yeah, we try to get their legal names and spelling correctly. And you can probably just say, well, I just want to spell your name correctly and get your full legal name on here that's going to show up on title. Okay. Keep all the documents, but right? you can have, have a copy of your ID. Okay, good. I I've got no problem with that. Here's, for me, what I want to put on this line is however they're going to apply for the loan, which probably is going to be their legal name. But for me, what the question I want to ask when I get to here, if I haven't asked it already, so hopefully I've already asked it, but if I haven't, have you already applied for a loan? Have you, have you talked to a lender? And if they have, what is the name that you're applied for the loan in? The, now, we want this to match how they're applying for the loan. Now, truth is, on the buyer broker itself, it's probably not that big of a deal that it's exactly the same as what they're applied for the loan. But because we are either using dot loop or I know some of you use um, DocuSign, because all of the documents are going to have the same name on it at that point because of that, you might as well get it right from the very beginning. So I want to find out, have you applied for the loan? And if they have, what was the name you did it as? And then I want to put down the name that they applied for the loan. Now, the re why would we want it to match how they applied for the loan? Andrew? So they don't actually later to change. Because that's what's... So at the end of the day, it's like... This is to save you a step down the road. So, don't, meaning, don't panic. Like, you don't need to be like, I need to see three forms of ID and your passport and all that stuff, Andy. Because I don't know who you are. Like, I don't need to be that detailed on it for this. But I at least want to make sure on the REPC that it has it. So, again... If they haven't applied for the loan, don't say, oh, well, let's wait to do this until you apply for the loan. Just ask them, how are you going to apply for the loan? What's the name you would use? And then they'll tell you whatever name. Great, put that on there. But worst case scenario, you'll have to do an addendum later on to fix it. That's the worst that will, is going to happen. But I'm just trying to save you. Yeah, exactly. I'm just trying to save you that one step of having to do that by saying, just find out how are you going to apply for the loan? What's the name you would do it? And put that on there as for the name. Make sense? All right. Next, terms of the agreement. So the buyer authorized or retains the company, including blank, whose name goes there? Yours. Yours, right? Good. As the authorized agent for the company, starting effective date listed above and ending at 5 p.m. on blank day of blank month of blank year. How long should we do this agreement for? So what date should we put in there? How far out? Six months. Okay, six months. What other thoughts? A year. A year, okay. A year. A year is what you do, okay. 
What else? Anybody have any other thoughts? I think it would depend on the situation. If you've got a client that's maybe very hesitant to want to sign something, maybe go for a shorter term if they would feel more comfortable signing it for a shorter term. Perfect. Yes, love it. Speaking of signing, I just remembered. So make sure on these for the twelve hour new agent for these that I get your license number at least once on here. If you haven't put it, get it at least one. Well, and you don't have to do it today necessarily, but I at least want it one time. Otherwise, Andrew said he would look them up. So I don't want to, I don't want Andrew to have to look them up for me. So all right. So um, yeah, the the length of it. I I here's there's not a right answer. There's not a wrong answer. Meaning, like, whatever date, time frame you put in there is great. Like, so, Andy, you said you do a year. Why? Well, just, you can start out, like, I, I agree with her, Jen. I just do a year, but you do want to just go to Well, normally I sign these for a year and just see what their reaction is. Because you never know. I, it, it, again, depends on the client. If they're relocating and they need to be in the house in the next month, do you need to sign it for a year? But it just protects you for okay, the good. whole time. So, now. I was going to say the same thing, but then. Like she said, if they're hesitant, then it can be like, well, we normally do this for a year, but this time we, we could do a, you know, like make it like special to make them feel more yes. comfortable. Good. Love it. Yes. So for me, what's the downside though to doing it? Because there is a downside to doing it for a long time, whether it's six months or a year. They'll even. drag their feet. Okay. Potentially. Good. Andrew? You'd have to demonstrate that you've been in contact with them the whole time through the history. Okay. Good. What else? There's still more. More downsides. There's more downside. <laughs> well, let me ask it this way. Do you really want somebody who is going to take a year to buy? No, they're not motivated. And what's this problem with them not being motivated? It's going to take forever. And what do you have to do every time they call you and say, Andy, hey, we just saw this house. We want to go take a look at it. And you drop everything and show them the house. You go show them that. You kind of have to go show them the house, right? Mm -hmm. That's what our fiduciary duty is, is that we will go and do that. So the downside, which I'm not saying is right or wrong, the downside is you also you owe them those fiduciary duties for the length of the time of this contract, which means if they're thinking, yeah, sometime in the next year, like you could end up showing, like, are there people out there that just like to go look at houses and, hey, you're my agent, you got to go show it to me, so let's go. Yeah. Well, we can always rip this contract up, too, if you're not happy with it. Okay, good. I love having you in class, <laughs> You just teeter that not so nice. nice. We're really not getting anywhere, so you know I'm not doing it, you know. But here's, Obviously. okay, so there, but let me ask you this. What if, so how many people does it take to sign for this contract to become effective? Two, two, two. Uh, at least two, right? You and the client. So how many people does it take to get out of it? Two. So just because you say, well, hey, I want to tear it up. What if I'm the client and I go, but Andy, no, I think you're a great agent. I like you. We love how you will just drop everything and go show us houses. So like, what well, I, want I appreciate that. I have another agent here who can probably help you out. Let me refer you to somebody. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. So. Now, the good news is that's where what you would want to do is say, let me talk to my broker because who owns this contract? The broker. The broker. So the broker can then reassign it and try to. But the downside, which I'm not saying don't do it for a year. Please don't hear that. Like if you want to do it for a year, just know you owe them those fiduciary duties for the length of that contract. Here's what I like to do. When I get to this section, I like to just say, so Barbara. What's your time frame that you were thinking about in terms of, of buying a home? So you could say it as, hey, I usually sign this for a year, but what's your time frame that you're looking at to buy? Three months. So three months. you want to be into something in the next three months. Okay, great. Well, so what I'm probably going to do then is I'm just going to put this out for four months. That way we're protected the, the three months we're looking for the home plus, plus probably the month that, to take it to close. Is that okay? Great. So like... However you want to do it. But I also love the idea, if she was hesitant, what if she's like, oh, I don't know. I don't want to be committed to you for that long. We had a bad experience with an agent. Then what? What would you feel comfortable with? Okay, so what would you, so what would you feel comfortable with? Two months. Great. Let's do it for two months then. Like, for me, I will even go as... as um, down to let's try it for a week. Let's have you sign it just for one week, just and then 
that gives you a chance to see, am I going to work out for you? But it also gives me a chance to see, do I want to work with you? Like it's a two-way street, so we can both check it out. What if they're still hesitant to that? Get up for, for just the property you're going to show them. Then at a minimum, I would say, then because the next line down, well, so let's go, let's go there. So we've got the time frame in there. So it says that it's going to last until that date or the closing of the acquisition of a property, whichever occurs first. And then it goes on to say that you're going to act as, on their behalf for the acquisition of a property in, and then it has in blank county or blank located at, and you can put the address of the property. So at a minimum for me, if you had somebody that was just like really hesitant, I would say totally understand that you don't know me very well. We just talked on the phone or we're just meeting for the first time. At a minimum, I want to know if I take you out and show you this property, if you buy it, you're going to use me. So I just need you to sign this, at least say, now, if they're hesitant to that, what are they telling you? They're just looking. Well, or they've got, they've got Andy over here. Andy's out of town and just, or, or he's a, don't be offended. He's a part-time agent, and he says to these people, well, I work during the day, so just call up and have an agent go show you houses, and then when you're ready to write an offer, let me know. Like, believe it or not, that happens in reality. So for me, the reason at a minimum I'm going to at least say, I want you to sign this at least for the properties that I'm going to go show you, if they're hesitant to that, they probably have somebody else they were planning on writing the offer with, in which case... I'd rather know about that right away. Does that make sense? Okay, good. Any questions on section one? What if you're showing them more than one property that day or something? Okay, good. Yeah, so great question. If you were going to be showing more than one property, say I was going to show them four or five, I could just write in here, see addendum, and then do an addendum to this listing. Here's the, the properties they're agreeing to pay. You'll, they, they will use you as their agent. Does that make sense? Do you have to fill out an address? No. You, so, yeah, great question. So, it's A or B. So, if you were going to do A, you could put in Salt Lake County and you're covered for every, everything in Salt Lake County. So, yeah, great question. You can't put <clears throat> on the in for the county? Yeah, for either. Uh, You probably could, but I would be, does everybody sign in? Yeah. So, I mean, you technically, you probably could do that. I feel like it just creates a, like, I guess what I'm saying is if you were to put a TBD, when it has tbd then you need to, would need to do an addendum saying this is what it is. Otherwise, it's, I guess, let me say it this way. It would be fine to put TBD as long as everything's good with your client. But the moment your client is looking for a way out, they'll use that as, well, we never determined that. So it was to be determined, and it hasn't been determined yet. Or they'll say, yeah, we determined it was going to be the, anything within um, 10 feet of this building or something. Like they'll, they'll, so to me, that's the only reason I would be hesitant on it. So I just went on a contract call the other day, but I put like Salt Lake slash Drew County, and it ended up being in Santee County. Now I don't, you don't have to go back out of it. It's not the word with the contract, but I mean, that could be coming an issue, or should I just do like an addendum saying, hey, this is in Santee, no. Salt Lake or Drew Ave? Yeah, you probably should to be safe. Like, are you going to need to? Probably not. But again, it's all. None, that will never be an issue as long as the client's happy, but if for some reason a client all of a sudden looks for a way out and they call an attorney, the first thing the attorneys do is start looking for, is there a loophole? Is there something that wasn't done? Is there an initial that was missed or something that they could then come back to go, well, they never agreed to. Now, keep in mind, though, the real answer to his question is there's the legal side of it and then there's the procuring cause, which technically is still part of the legal side, but... The procuring cause is going to be, did you do everything that led to them purchasing? Did you start, I like to think of it as dominoes falling over. Did you knock over the first domino that led to them buying the house? So if you did, 
then you're entitled to the commission whether you have this or not. But again, just to be safe it probably would be better. So for, for me personally, I almost think just writing in here all Utah counties. Then you're covered in all counties for Utah. Does that make sense? That's how you do it? Okay. Good. So Any? Put all in under a for county. All county. I would I personally I would say all count, counties in Utah or all Utah counties. Something like that. That's just because again, somebody could try to say well, in all county, there's not an all county. Like I mean hopefully they wouldn't, but you know what I mean. Okay. So great questions. Good. Anything else on section one? I do have one more question. Yep. So with like let's say I'm just talking to the wife and the husband is high on person with that one. So on this, since I'm in communication with her primarily, can I just have her just sign this and that's fine? Or do I need to make sure both of them are signed? Yeah, I would again get both. In fact, the scenario that I was telling you that we did a um, arbitration on. That is what had happened, is the wife, the, even worse actually, the wife signed the husband's name. So it was only in his name, but she signed only his name. And so he then came, again, when they wanted out, he, they came back and said, well, technically I didn't sign it, she did. And she wasn't even on the contract, so she shouldn't have been signing my name. So I, I would say, honestly, like for your protection, if it's going to be both, say, we're going to need both. I'll have just you sign it. Like, I would have her sign it because then she's going to go home and probably say, well, I've already signed, so I'm committed, so, like, you might as well. So I would definitely, but I would get his signature as well. Good question. All right, section two, brokerage fee. Here's what this says. Now, remember, I'm we're going to go through this, and I'm going to explain it to you the way I would basically explain it to a client. Okay, so in this brokerage fee section, how I explain this to the client, it's what this says is that in the event you purchase a property, that I'm going to be entitled to a 3% commission plus, in, and on this particular document it says a 295. Now, we have other ones that have 395, 495, 595, 695. Do we have any others, Andrew, beyond 695? Those are the ones that are, are in there. But... What they're agreeing is that you will get paid a 3% uh, commission on the acquisition price plus, in this case, a 295. So how I explain it to the client, though, is what I tell them is, let me tell you how that works. What that, what's going to happen is as we go out and look at properties, the other agent is going to be offering to share the commission that their seller is paying to me. So. What we will do is whatever amount they're offering, which most of the time is how much? 3% is going to cover the 3% of this. So the only thing you would owe me at closing is 295 Now, what I have found is usually the clients are like, oh, that's it? Like, so if you even said a 595 they're going to be like, oh, really? That's it? So, but here's if they have hesitancy to it. So if they were worried about it at all of like, what? 595 what I say to them is, so the commission is going to be offset by whatever they're offering on the MLS, which typically is 3%, although in today's market, I would make sure to tell them there are some listings that don't offer a 3%. So what that means is if, if you saw a house you liked and they were only offering, like, there are some, what's the lowest you guys have seen offered, by the way? $2,500. Okay. Do I do I fifteen hundred? Okay. Do I hear anything less than fifteen? Andrew's got his finger up. One dollar. One dollar. I've seen that one too. I've seen one of those. There was one. They were off, which would mean what if you took your client to it? They would owe you three percent. Yeah, well, minus a dollar. Minus a dollar. Yeah, minus one dollar. So, you want to ask your clients during this part here? How do you want me to handle it when I see a home that they're offering less than three percent? How do you want me to handle it? Well, what are they going to say? Depends on the home. That's probably what they're going to say. Well, well, you know, it depends on the house. Okay, but like, so what it means is if we find one that's offering two and a half, you would owe the other half of a percent. 
Now, I always do tell them, I'm going to do everything I can, Holly, to negotiate that. I will go to the, um, by the listing agent and tell them that you don't have the cash to pay the difference. And, and I, I just say, look, I'm pr what I don't want to do is scare the client away from signing this because of this. So I wanted, I'm going to present to them, of, look, almost always I have been successful at getting them to still pay the commission. So it's very likely you're not going to still have to pay anything. But I at least want you to know when you call me and say, I want to go see this house, I may say, the reason I haven't shown that one to you yet is because they're only offering a dollar. Do you tell them that in the beginning, or do you wait until you potentially find a house that shows less? I would say it would be better to tell them in the beginning. But again, I would say to them, that doesn't mean let's not go look at it. Just know in the back of your mind, I've got to try to negotiate that commission with them, which generally I can do. So I want them to know I generally can do it. Um, so I'm actually just downstairs at Vanguard, and one thing that I think is really important to mention is, in addition to telling your clients, is making sure that you convey that to the lender, because there's been many times where you can charge like a 9.95 or whatever. Um, in addition to the extra commission, the lender hasn't accounted for that in their document figures, and so often you just have to waive it, or at closing even they'll be like, wait, why are they charging me 5.95? So. I'm finding that some agents don't even review this yeah. by a broker with them, and then at closing, the clients are surprised and feel a little bit like take it advantage. Yeah, of like they're yeah. charging me this 4.95, and I don't know what it was. What is this? And yeah. I mean, I can always like say like, oh, this is for the admin fees. Like you know, try to do a little bit of damage control, but it's so important that you guys show the, like tell the lender if yeah. they are and the type of company because we won't know if you nobody has told us that the buyers. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate that. Yeah. So, and, and the other thing that I will usually tell the client too on that when I'm explaining it to them is I usually tell them, look, I'm gonna even, I'm gonna do my best to get the seller to pay that for you as well. And so, because if you're already gonna be asking them to pay closing costs, I just add this on to what we're asking them to pay in closing costs. But then again, thank you. You've got to make sure you tell the lender. Like, let's say I asked for $3,000 in closing costs and I'm including two ninety five dollars in that. You need to tell the lender that's including our admin fee of the two ninety five dollars or a five ninety five dollars or whatever. Otherwise, they'll use up, they do everything they can to use up that $3,000. And if they can't, if they can use it up with not including this, they won't include this. So you want to make sure that you're telling them. So what does that conversation look like with the other agent and what do we have to do on our end? To get them to pay this? So, okay, great. Yeah, good question. So, let's say that I have the buyer as your listing. So, I bring you an offer and I just, let's say that we we're offering, it was a $400,000 home, and we were going to ask for $9,000 in closing costs. I would probably ask for $9,295, and then I would just say, hey, here's our offer. Um, they're offering $400,000. They've asked for nine thousand two hundred ninety-five in closing costs. Um, so take it to your seller, see what they think. So you don't even have to tell them about like your additional percentage. Nope. I mean, yeah, I think he was asking, what if, if you go to a listing that's a two percent listing? Yeah. Oh, is that what you're meaning? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. And how do you have that conversation Thanks. with the other agent? Okay, good. So yeah, so let's do that. So let's assume you've gone and taken a listing. You listed it at five percent. And you are keeping three and you're offering two on the MLS. Okay? So I call you up and I say, hey, I've got a client who uh, would like to take a look at your home. Is this still available? Yes. It is. Okay, great. So they will, they want to go look at it, say, tomorrow at 10 o'clock. And um, question for you, though, they signed a buyer broker with me where they will owe me a 3% commission. I noticed you're only offering two on the uh, MLS. So my clients can't afford to pay the difference. Is that something we could go back to the seller and ask them to pay? No. No? Okay. So I guess the question is, do you want me to show the property or not? Um. <laughs> <laughs> you do want me to. Okay, so how are we going to work that out though? Because if they go see it and fall in love with it, which honestly I think they're going to, like I, I, they don't have the cash to pay that extra 1%. Now let me pause for in this role play for a second.
This is the approach that I always take, and I would recommend you always take this approach. I, and once I decided to do this, like it changed everything for me. Always take the approach that I'm going to assume he needs the commission worse than I do. Like meaning, if if it doesn't work out, I don't. I'm not taking a. I'm not taking less than three percent on my commission. And even when it wasn't true for me, I took the approach of I don't need it. Like if they don't buy a house, I don't really care. I'll still pay my bills. I can afford to. Do, even when it wasn't true, I still took that mindset of like, you need the commission. He wants the deal to happen worse than I do. I guess that's the way to say it. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Like I take that mental approach of, I just am gonna believe he needs the deal worse than I do. Now, the market we have been in, where like multiple offers and all that kind of stuff. That might not work as well because he might be like, well, that's fine. I got four other offers sitting here. Like, so keep in mind that can play into this as well. But I just take the, that approach. So did you want me to show the property or not? Uh, what if I said no? I just want to say no. You, oh, you, you really? Do you want to talk to your clients and let them know that you have somebody that wants to see the house, but the reason they're not showing it is because you're only offering the 2%? Yeah, I'll let them know. Okay, great. Let me know what they say. So I, you just let it go at that point and then you let Well, the probably. So here's the approach I would take when, so if Holly was my client, I would have said, okay, Holly, this one, they're only offering 2%, which means you would have to pay the other one. Now, I'm going to give you another thing you I would try as well. Okay, so try splitting it? Say, hey, I'm splitting it. Like maybe, but five. again, I, took, I always take the approach of I'm not taking less on my commission. So, like, I'm not splitting. Again, I promise you, most agents. I was going to have you do a show of hands, but I probably better. I was going to be like, who needs a commission like tomorrow? Like, but I probably better not do it. <laughs> yeah, but I, I take the approach of like, he needs this deal to close to make his house payment next month. I don't. Even, even if I did, I took the approach of I don't need it. So I don't really care. Like, if you don't want the deal to happen, I don't care. So. Here's how I would handle it. So Holly, I'm gonna call and play poker with them. Cause like she really wants the house, okay? I'm gonna play poker with them, are you okay with me doing that? Yeah. So like I'm gonna do everything I can so you don't have to pay that extra 1%, right. okay? okay? So, um, yeah, so you'll talk to your seller? Okay, well, um, get, talk to them and see if they're, I mean, let them know, you've got a real buyer that's interested in their home, if they'll pay the extra 1% to me. Now. In reality, let's assume like he took a 5% listing and he kept three. Like, don't you think it's a pretty good chance he's gonna offer me half of that? At this point, I would think so. But let's say he did a 4% and he's only keeping two. Do you wanna get the property sold? Like, let your clients know you've got somebody who wants to see the house, but they're, now, here's the truth. Is he gonna go back to his client and say, Hey, I only offered 2% on the MLS, and what that means is people aren't going to show your house. Well, agents aren't going to do that. So it's probably unlikely that he's even going to call. Although I would say, honestly, he probably would be happy to call his client and say, because if, if, if I were him, let me tell you how I would handle it. So let's reverse the roles. And I said, all right, I'll call my client. I would call my client and say, Let's assume it was a 4% listing. Hey, I got somebody that's interested in the house, but they've actually said that they won't show it unless it's a 6% listing. Like, I'm going to try to get 6% now, not just 5 to give her 3 and me keep 2. Does that make sense? Yeah, because in the beginning he signed up, he did that as a 4%, which is technically discounted. I mean, from what I'm understanding, and I'm new, so maybe I'm wrong. Seems like that would then this would be like a reason to be like, see, I, this is worth the service. Like, I, I deserve yeah, it. You would hope, yeah. Right. So, but even at a minimum, like, let's say, I would love for him to call his client and say, I've got some, now, depending on how long the home's been on the market, if it's been on the market for a month, it's very likely if he calls his client and says, hey, if we can offer 3% to them, I've got somebody who's pretty interested. Like, it's very likely the client's like, all right, let's do it. Like, so I guess what I'm saying is don't just lay down when you see one at 2% or the $1 even. Like, even if I saw a dollar, I would call up and say, Andrew, I've got a buyer for your listing, but you're only offering a dollar. 
gonna they've signed a buyer broker with me, and they've told me not to show them that property unless you'll pay a 3%. Like, go back and ask your seller if they'll pay a 3% commission. Like, why not? Okay. So let's say, though, so let's go back to your scenario. Let's say you call me back. Nope, my seller said that they uh, won't pay the extra commission. Okay, well, let me talk to my client. Even if I already know she wants to see it, I'd say, let me talk to my client. And then I would either call her back and say, do you still want to see that house? They won't pay it. So that means you, either you're going to have to, or I still have one more idea that we could try. But you need to know if it doesn't work, our agreement is you're going to have to pay so, how do you feel about it? Okay, what's your one more thing you're going to try? Oh, sure. So, now we go see the house. So, we go show the house. Afterwards, so uh, let's, let's... So, you go show it. You, you tell them, okay, we're going to take a look at it anyway and you'll talk to your client. Yeah. And then my client, I'm going to go look at it. So, let's say it's a 4000 400000 dollar home. So... You guys tell me, like, how much, when you're writing an offer on a home of 400000 if you were going to ask the seller to pay closing costs, how much typically are you asking for? Oh, <laughs> I'm like, you guys are all too new. Would it be like five to 7000 uh, It's probably going to be a little more than that. Probably more like eight or nine. Yeah, probably going to be more eight or $9,000 is what, what I guess would be. So what's 1% of 400000 so four thousand, right? Yeah. So let's say that if the, the lender has said we need to ask for let's just keep it easy, let's say eight thousand dollars. Okay. I'm gonna write the offer of four hundred thousand with the seller paying closing costs of twelve thousand dollars. So I'm just gonna add the one percent on to what we're asking for in closing costs. Now I'm gonna go present the offer. Here's the offer for your client. We're offering four hundred thousand. We need twelve thousand in closing costs. Take it and see what your client says. So he takes it to his client. I I don't know what they're going to do based on that. They they may try to negotiate whatever. But I could just let's say that they come back and they say we'll do um, four hundred thousand. We're only paying six thousand in closing costs. Then I would come to Holly and say, well, what do you want to do? I don't want to pay you that six thousand dollars more. Okay, so do, should we go offer them four hundred and six thousand and ask them to pay twelve thousand in closing costs? Yeah. Okay, four hundred and six thousand, which essentially is yeah, we're moving numbers. Around. Yeah, we're moving numbers around, but essentially, I'm getting them to agree to pay this towards closing costs. Now, the only thing that that could be argued is is commission and closing costs. And, and I, I don't know that I know the answer. I would argue that it, yes. The reason I would say I would argue yes is I've done it many, many times where I've included this 295 into it, which technically is commissions. So I would argue yes. Like I guess what I'm saying is I would try it this way before giving up and taking a 2% commission. Does that make sense? The other option that you could do is if you really wanted to, to be safe is you could say... We want, you, when you write, because here's the thing. If I said, talk to your seller and let me know, the truth is, my this is my belief, anyway. I believe most agents are not going to go back to their client and ask them for that extra 1%. I believe most are too chicken to do it. So they're just going to say, no, nope, sorry. Because they think the client beat them up already to get them to four. It's not going to happen. So here's what the way I get around that. I would go ahead and ask for the 8000 in closing costs, and then I would put in here for the seller to pay towards the buyer's agency, or buyer's agreement to this. Yeah, sorry, how do you, what's the wording on it? Buyer and seller agree, seller to contribute 1% to the buyer's brokerage fee. Yeah, so towards the buyer's brokerage fee of the 1% or $4,000. Where do you put that? On an addendum. And we also put in addition other composition yeah so in a, yeah thing so then I'm going to present because now he has to go talk to his and the clients probably going to go what's this and what what would you say to your client if they said well what's this other four thousand dollar thing what's that I've just explained that the typical amount for commission is six percent since we lowered the commission for somebody to come back and 
Yeah. So now let's say they counter back. We'll do this and we'll do this, but we're not doing this. <laughs> what do you want to do, Holly? I'll give you another solution you could try as well on this, <laughs> which may or may not work. But yeah, she may go, okay, I'll pay you, in which case, great. In the event that they've agreed to pay this, now, one of the other options that I could say to Holly, now this may or may not work, but I could say, the other option we could do is we could use that $8,000 to pay, or 4000 of that eight to go towards that extra commission, and then um, we could ask the lender to bump your interest rate a little bit and have them cover the other closing costs. Yeah, that's good. Try that. Okay. So, like, here's my point. Notice there are many options before I just give in and take lesser of a commission. Yeah, but but let's, let's be frank. We're good agents here at Century 21. That's not the case out in the market. Most agents who are part-time agents won't even ask for that extra commission. So, I mean, most people will take 2%. Just because, and you know, all these discount brokerage, when we get the same situation with the homey one, we took a buyer to, it's like, what, what are they offering, 1% or something? It's like, okay, why even go there, kind of like. But it's like, is that our responsibility to not take a client to a home that they want to buy because of our commission or not? I mean, I, yeah, good, I, I, good I question. know the argument. You guys, right. no. so what is your fiduciary duty? You have to show you have to show them, yeah. That's gross. Well, it's all about service and continued business as well. So I think if you explain all of it to the client, maybe, I mean, they'll use you again knowing that you're outside of yeah, So let me, perfect, thank you. Here's how I deal with it. This is, let's say I tried everything we could to get that house and I could not get to the 3%. Like I tried all of these avenues we've said, still just isn't happening. Holly wants the house. Here's the conversation I'm going to have with Holly. Holly, we agreed to a 3% commission, right? I know you love this house. I know you also don't have the 1%. I'm going to amend this, and I'm going to change it to where you're only going to pay me the, what they're offering. However, what I expect is for you to replace that income. And what I mean is, I don't mean for you to give it to me, but as you hear of people out there thinking of buying or selling, that you are going to refer people to me so that in the end, like I come out ahead. Does that make sense? Yeah. Oh, so Would you be willing to do that? Great. So yeah. let me tell you a quick story that I had on that. I had a client, they, he worked for Wendy's, was be, he was going to be a general manager, was transferred into here from Florida. I went out and was showing them properties, had a buyer broker sign with them. We went into a model home out in West Jordan. They fell in love with it, but their price, they wanted a three-car garage. They could afford it with a two-car garage, but as soon as you threw the three-car garage, you put them over what they could qualify for. So they said, well, let us think about it. So um, overnight, they're going to think about it. Well, after we left the I le they left the office to go get dinner. While they're gone to dinner, they drive by again. The agent's sitting in the model home still. They walk into the model home. Without me there now, the agent says to them, you know, if you didn't have an agent our builder gives you the third car garage for free. So if you didn't have your agent, you could actually qualify to buy this house. Now, the clients had signed this, so they called me, said, Russ, we stopped back by there, and the agent said, if we weren't using you, they would give us that for free. We know we owe you, and we don't want to do that. We want you to be included, but we also really want that house. And so I just said, well, hey, let me do my job. I bet I can negotiate it. So I called up the agent sitting in the model home and I was like, what are you doing? Like, I brought these clients to you and now, so like, just go tell the builder, like, we want to make an offer on it, but we want him to still give them the garage for free. And she said, well, I'll talk to him. Called me back, said, he won't do it. it this, this was back, I don't remember what year it was, but the market was a lot like it is today where a builder feels like, I can sell it to somebody else, so I don't really care. So he just would not budge. So I went back to them and I had the conversation I just did with Holly of, look, I don't want to be the thing that stops you from getting the house you want. So I'll totally, like, not only was I like giving up 1%, I'm saying I'll give up the whole 3%. You go buy the house. However, I expect you to replace yourself. That one was a little stronger conversation than the 1%. Meaning I was saying, look, I, I'll totally get out of the way, but I expect you to replace that. Like, you need to refer people to me so that I still, in the end, will get paid. 
And they were like, oh, for sure. We totally appreciate you doing that. Yes, we'd love it. Now, in my mind, I really, I'm like, they just moved here from Florida. Who do they know? They don't know anyone. Like, they're not going to refer anybody to me. So, but I get, went into it knowing I'm probably just losing a client. So they bought the house without me, everything. A year later, I get a phone call from the wife. Russ, this is so-and-so. Do you remember me? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> I didn't say it that way. But, but, but of course, I'm like, yeah, I remember you. I'm like, yeah, how you doing? How's the house? And she's like, it's awesome. But look, I want you to know we have not forgotten what you did for us. Our next-door neighbor just got a job transfer, and we told them they have to use you. Like, we told them they don't have a choice because she knew she owed me. I said, oh, I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Went and listed their house, sold it. They moved on. A year after that, I get a phone call from her again. Russ, this is so-and-so. Do you remember me? And I'm like, yeah, of course I do. Thank you for referring those people to me last year, and it was awesome. What's going on? Wendy's is now transferring us. I don't remember where, but somewhere else. And we need to sell our house, and we want you to come out because we still feel like we owe you. Great. I went and listed their house. They moved. Now, I ended up with two deals out of that that I promise you, if I would have said, no, Holly, you have to pay me because you agreed to this. What are the chances a year later they would have said to their neighbor, you have to use this guy? Zero. What are the chances a year after that they would have called me? Zero. Yeah, none. So, like, recognize that to some extent, like, just doing the right thing for your client is going to pay off in the end. So, but at the same time, don't be afraid to say, look, I'm going to actually, because this seller is a jerk, <laughs> they won't pay my commission. I'm going to go ahead and take two on this. But I I but expect, yeah, but don't forget, and I expect you to re refer people, let other people know, like, hey, I helped you out, and like, do what you can to get me some more business. Is that fair? Yes. Of, and of course, they're excited about the house. It's fair. They'll love it. They'll be willing to do it. All right. Make sense? Yeah. All right. So any other questions on the brokerage fee? Or the ad, usually the admin fee, I get some heartburn. You guys haven't given me I do have one question. Okay, good. Thank so, you. So, well, I've been told that that's kind of a good strategy with like mobile homes since obviously the commissions aren't as high, like just to bump that up to like a thousand or two thousand. And then you get the difference <coughs> minus the two hundred ninety five, is that correct? On your split, yes. Yeah. Yes. But I, I want to make sure that that was clear because sometimes agents think, well, yeah, I'm going to charge a thousand dollars or nine ninety five. And so the additional $700, I just get to keep it all. And on your split, yes. Like it's still based on your whatever split you're on, you'll get that portion. But yes. Does that make sense? Because so, for a while, we had one broker here that was telling people, go charge um, $595. Is that right? $595? Because then they're saying that way you can use the transaction coordinator. It covers the 295 plus the five or the other 295 for using a transaction coordinator, but then people would get their paycheck assuming that the 595 covered it. But of the additional 295, they were only getting 70 percent. So 70 percent of the 295 was covered, but and then they would come, hey, you, so and so said that was going to cover it, and I ended up having to pay an extra whatever. Does that make sense? So. It's on your split. I just want to make sure that's really clear so that you don't forget. Yeah. Well, you just answered one, 595. That's for if you want to use like a transaction coordinator. Uh -huh. And what's the third one for? Because I know there's three different prices 295. Well, you can charge whatever you want, essentially up to 995. Huh? Up to 995. Yeah. We had one agent that did $4,700 admin fee and got it. But like because of that, the company is kind of like, eh, let's maybe like keep it somewhat <laughs> reasonable. So, so go ahead. Because it's it's called an admin fee now. The name will change when legislation gets in front of it and yeah. it says you cannot charge a client this anymore. Then we'll call it something else. That's why we put a limit on. Yeah. In fact, let me give you the history of it. So in 1997, the company I was with at the time. When I say started it, meaning in Salt Lake area, they were the company that first did one of these. We called it a transaction fee. And no, compliance fee is what we call it. And so the way we sold it to our clients is we would say, 
we're going to have a paralegal review your documents, and, and it was one ninety five then. And so we would say there's an additional one hundred ninety five dollar fee because it's this compliance fee that we're going to have an, a uh, paralegal look over your contract so you know that everything's good. The government got well, then all of a sudden everybody started doing it. So the government got wind of this and came in and said no. You can't call it a compliance fee. You can't call it a transaction fee. You have to call it what it is, which is additional commission. And so for a lot of years, it would say 3% of the acquisition plus an additional $295 in commissions. And so for a lot, and then was it Berkshire Hathaway or Prudential had a lawsuit that they won calling it an admin fee, and they won. So then everybody's now calling it an admin fee. But the, usually the I, I was trying to decide if I was going to have this conversation or not because like we're on section two and we've been an hour and ten minutes so we will be here for an additional three days we'll pick up the pace after this do you want to know why we charge it yes mm -hmm. like the real reason we charge it, it? I want to know what's important. here's the real reason when I first started the highest any new agent ever got was a 50-50. Nobody ever, like in the marketplace, like I'm not just saying like in our company, like in the market, if you were brand new, you were on a 50-50 split. The highest anybody ever got up to was an 80-20 split. Like this was the top agent in the company kept 80%, the company got 20%, there were no caps, <coughs> like forever, that's how it worked. And so what happened though, and to some extent, I feel like I even know who created this, but it's probably not true, but I have one broker in mind that I'm like, that guy ruined it for all of us. But anyway, he started offering to people a 90% commission, 90-10. And he would go up, that's how he started recruiting. Like you can buy recruits. Like if I went to if I was at another company and I came to Andy and said, We'll pay you 150% commission off of everything you just <laughs> like, would you switch companies today if they said I'll give you 150%? Yes. I would do. <laughs> right? So you can purchase people at, which is essentially what he started doing. Well, it is tough for a company. Remember, I'm just telling you the truth. Mm -hmm. So this is how you should explain it to your clients. Okay? Just but don't judge till the end. Now it's not uncommon. Meaning, and in order to get off of fifty-fifty, you had to do a, a good amount of business. Like essentially, our cap at the company is twenty-one thousand dollars. Like to get off of a fifty-fifty, the company had to make about twenty thousand dollars. So, like, you essentially had to cap to get to a sixty-forty. Does that make sense? And then you had to do, the company would make another probably $20,000 before you'd go to a 70-30. And then they'd make another $20,000 off of you. Like, as an agent, I had, I was on an 80-20 and the company was making $60,000 off of what I was paying them. So, like, that's not including the franchise fee, okay? So, what happened, though, is they started doing things like what we have done now of there's a cap in place and you're on a 50 50 if you're a new agent for your first like four four, four deals and like all, all of these things that what the, really all of this actually doesn't matter anymore once you have the cap of the twenty one thousand dollars like I know some agents that say well number one we have one agent at least right it, that just pays this writes a check to Andrew every year and just like, here's the $21,000, leave me on the high, right? Yeah. So, like, you could do that. But, like, that's how much we make off of Our top agents, like, typically we're making $21,000 off of Like, can you see what I'm saying? Like, what am I saying? Then Help me. What am I telling you? It's tough to run a business. It's tough to run a brokerage. Like, keep in mind, like, I wasn't making anywhere near some of what our top agents today are making, and I back here, the company made sixty thousand dollars off me. Now, you take what some of these agents today are making, and if you were if they were on this, like the company would be killing it. I mean, like our top agent last year individual was one point four. Yeah, close to that. Really close to that. So do the math. Like we would have made two hundred thousand dollars off of him, not two. Not or yeah, not 21. Like, 
The company would be happy about that. So what company said is we got to come up with a way to stay in business because we're giving the agents all the commission now. And so they had this idea, let's charge this $195 initially, which is now for us a $295 fee because the company's got to make some money to stay in business. So tell your clients that when they go, what's this $295? What you say to them is, I make too much money. <laughs> so it's the way you, because the company's, Andy, because the company's giving you so much of the commission, even though I know you don't agree, <laughs> your client gets to pay an additional $295 in commission so that we can stay in business. How do you think that'll go over when you tell your client that? <laughs> so, so great. <laughs> So that's the truth. That is, you said you wanted the truth of why we charge it, and now you know why. Like, but that can be included in the closing costs? Yes. Yes. Yeah, which, so by the way, like, the good news is, like, our top, top agents are happy doing this, obviously. But yet, it's interesting to me, like, we also have some... And, if this is you, like, I'm not calling you out, but I am, I guess. <laughs> if this is you, like, Andrew, like, we have people that freak out about paying this amount. And I'm, like, always, like, are you kidding me? Like, you should, this is, like, we got to stay in business. So, uh, okay. I don't know. We get so many great things being here, so it yeah. sense. We'll ask you that in about five years okay. when you're making 200. and you So remember that, Andrew, when she comes in and goes, Hey, Andrew, can you give me a better deal? And Andrew's <laughs> going to be like, let's go back to, write it down. Well, we have to have to Austin. I'm going to have to Austin first. I'm just, yeah. Okay. So, question, any other questions on brokerage fee? Are we good? Good. Yeah, I'll get it right now. Thanks. Is it bugging you that the door's open? No. Oh. <laughs> so, any questions on brokerage fees? Does that make sense? All right, next. Protection period. There's a blank line there. What should we put? We're going to pick up the speed now. We'll be done by 12 still. Protection period. If within blank months, what should we put there? Okay, Eric's saying three. Six. Andrew says six. Two. There's not a right answer on this one. Here's for me again. Here's how I think of this. This protection period is essentially just the only time it really for me comes into play too much is going to be like let's say that we had somebody sign it for a week. That they would they sign this buyer broker agreeing that, that you would be their agent for one week or one property. Well, yeah, even the property, I guess, works. But what this protects is that if they wanted to go buy that house two or three months later, or you know, even if you did six, is fine. Like it's they're agreeing if they go buy this house, they're you're still gonna get paid. So that's the idea of this protection period. Now, here's the thing though. Let's say you signed this with somebody for six months. You put in the protection period an additional six months. The first six months runs out, they didn't buy a house. How much time are you spending keeping track of what they're doing? Not much. Yeah, so I, how are you going to know that they went and bought another house? You just search tax records every six months for all the people. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and then if you've got time to do that, you're focused on the wrong thing. Like, so for me, like, I say put a few months in there, and if you want to put six months, I think that's great. Just know, like, you're probably not going to be doing a whole lot to go after it. But I do feel like you want to have some months in there as, again, it keeps honest people honest. It's, it has them still feeling like, okay, we would still have to use them because of that, okay? All right. And I'm going to pick up the pace a little bit. If you have additional questions, please stop me and ask. I, I don't interpret it as I don't want to answer your questions because I want you to leave here feeling comfortable with this document. All right, four, buyer representation disclosures. What this is, is saying, I do want to read this first sentence to you. It says, the buyer warrants that the buyer has not entered into any other exclusive buyer broker agreement with any other brokerage that is still in force and effect. So... The thing that they're agreeing to when they're signing this is that they haven't signed with anybody else. Now, the other thing that they're agreeing to as part of this is the next sentence. The buyer will, A, 
in all communications with other real estate agents, notify the agents in advance that the buyers entered into this exclusive buyer broker agreement with the company. So what is their job? So you need when you get to this section, tell your clients what this is saying is you haven't already signed this with somebody else, and when you talk to another agent, the first thing you should tell them is, I have already signed a buyer broker agreement. Now, why would we want to tell, train our clients to do that? So they don't get themselves in a tricky position. Yeah, good. And what? here's the other side of it. For real, what do you do if you... So, Ann, let's say I call you on your listing. So, ring, ring. Hi. Hey, Andy, this is Russ. I'm calling about your listing on Birch and Pine. Great. Uh, are you working with an agent? Uh... Well, yeah, kind of. Well, that's great. Uh, have you signed a prior broker agreement? Um, so uh, let, let's rewind it. Ask it again. Because remember, if my job is to tell them. It's okay, so ask again. Oh, great. Uh, where did you see the home? Did you just, so just ask me anywhere. Are you working with <laughs> Yes, I am. We, we've signed a buyer broker. Excellent, excellent. What's your agent's name? It is Eric Jones. Great. Do you mind if we talk to him, or do you want to? Set up an appointment with him to come see the home. See what see. Look at what agents do when you say, "I've got an agent." I've yes, I've signed a buyer broker with Eric. What do you, what do agents do? They quit trying to grab your client. Is what I want you to see. Yeah. So, you want to train your clients to like to some extent. If they saw an open house, you want them to walk in and go. Hey, just so you know, I'm working with Eric. I've signed a buyer broker agreement. Cool. And, and then he backs card. off and leaves me alone. And here's his card. Yeah, here's his card. Yeah, so thank you. In this section, give them a stack of cards. When you come across an agent, hand them my business card, tell them they have questions. That way they won't bug you. They'll call me. Make sense? Okay. All right, section five, agency relationships. I'm going to actually skip over this a little bit. On Thursday, we're going to do the seller packet. I'll spend a little more time on the agency relationship section. But just know for this one, when I get to this section, I just am telling my client that I am your agent. I'm on your side. Too many times, they feel like they're negotiating against you. Like, when I get here, I want them to know we're on the same team. Like, we're fighting for the same thing. I'm not trying to take advantage of you. I'm trying to do everything I can to help you negotiate the best deal from the seller. So we're on the same team. We're sitting on the same side of the table. We're not adversaries is what this is saying. Okay? We'll go into more of that on Thursday. All right, next page. It's been an hour and 23 minutes. Wow, page Woo! two. Woo! <laughs> that is, by the way, this is a record, the longest it's taken us to get through page one. So congratulations. <laughs> No, actually, I no, I do appreciate it. it. Honestly, if we were done with the whole thing by now, like for me at least, the class would be horrible. So, all right, Andrew would be grateful. But <laughs> all right, so um, section six, professional advice. Here's how I like to explain this section to the client. You'll love this. What I tell the client when I get to this is I say, Andy, what this says is don't trust me in anything I tell you. <laughs> that's what I. That's how I tell the client. What this is saying is I'm trained in the marketing of real estate. I am not a professional in every other area that you're going to think I am. So don't. When you ask me a question, don't trust the answer I give to you. Is what I. And then usually they're like, what? And and at that point I will then refer them to. Let's take a look at the buyer due diligence form, which we will do in a minute. But I just tell them, look, I'm not a property inspector. I'm not an accountant. I'm not an attorney. Like, you're going to ask me questions about the property that you're going to ask me, like, where the property line is. I'm not a surveyor. So I can give you my best guess, but what this is saying is don't trust that I know where the property line is. Don't trust that the plumbing is perfect because I say the toilet's flush. Like, that's what this says, okay? Don't trust me. I'll show you how we use it. Well, I'll do it now. Typically, what I will do then is now, let's say that I told Andy that. This says don't trust me. We're now out looking at a house, and he goes, Hey, you think this wiring is correct on the, on the whatever? And I go, well, remember, don't trust what I tell you. It's how I'll approach it again. Now, don't trust me, but like it looks like it's probably fine. But if you're concerned, like you should talk to an electrician. Because remember, don't rely on me. 
same thing. He asked me, where's the property line? Well, it looks like it's right there, but remember, I'm not the professional, so don't trust me. Because we get ourselves in trouble so many times because we go, oh, no, we want the deal to happen. Oh, yeah, no, I'm sure that's the property line. And then it's not. And then they come back on you. So this is your protection of don't sue me because I told you that that's the property line. Yeah. All right. Section 7, dispute resolution. We're agreeing that any dispute that arises out of this, we shall first go to mediation. So we're saying we shall go to mediation before going to court. Section 8, which is what Parker brought up earlier, is saying in the event we end up in court, the prevailing party is entitled to reasonable attorney's fees. So if you go to court, and, you, and which I actually have a good friend that owned a title company that got sued by another title company, and they lost, and... When they lost, it was kind of like, all right, well, we'll pay the, the fee for what we lost in this. But then the other title company said, well, no, now we're suing you for our attorney's fees, which are like was 10 times what the actual lawsuit, I don't know if that's right, but a lot. And that actually is what killed them, put them out of business. So attorney's fees can come back to hurt you. So all right, section nine, buyer's authorization. They're authorizing us to, A, disclose the closing uh, price to the MLS. Why would we want that? Why would we want their permission to disclose what the final purchase price was? Okay, good. We, we need it for comparables, but there's another reason we have to get their permission. We're a non-disclosure state, and so because of that, we can't disclose without permission. So we're getting permission to disclose. B, to communicate with them for the purposes of soliciting real estate goods and services. Why do we need that? So we can send an email to all that. Yeah, because of the do not call list. So good. And, and then C, I think in here, is there C or not C? Yeah. Just, it's interesting. It's A, B, then the buyer further agrees. Oh, that's what it is. Yeah. That um, we could put the earnest money into an interest bearing trust account, which we actually looked at doing. But there was so much red tape that we're not currently doing that. So that gives us the option, but we're not doing it, just so you guys know. That we're not collecting interest and then donating it to UAR Hoff. So if the client asks ever, we they're giving us permission to do it, but we currently are not doing it. That doesn't mean we wouldn't change. But the red tape was so much that we finally said, forget it. Because we wanted to do that, actually. All right, 10. There are or are not additional terms. So this is where I would say if you were going to use an addendum, you would check the R box and put it on an addendum. If not, you'll just do R not. And I will tell you most of the time, well, it would be a scenario of what Barbara was saying. Let's say that there were five. They didn't want to sign this for every property, but they would sign it for the five we were going to go look at. I would know I need to do it. So outside of that, it's pretty rare you're going to do an attachment. So you'll almost always do there are not. 11, equal housing opportunity, says that we will follow all the federal, state, and local fair housing laws, which means we can't discriminate. Uh, 12 is we're agreeing that we can use electronic transmissions and counterparts. So um, counterparts would be signing the same document, but like, like a photocopy of the document. So like let's say, I'm, let's say that Andy and I were working together on a transaction, like we were both going to be representing a listing. We fill out this agreement, make a photocopy of it. He goes to the husband's work to get a signature, and I drive to the wife's and get a signature on a photocopy. So he takes the original. I took a photocopy. He got the husband's signature on the original. I get the wife's on a photocopy. We come back, put them together. That would be counterparts, and we're agreeing that's okay to do. Does that make sense? All right. 13 is the due on sale clause. What's a due on sale clause? When, if you're doing solar financing, then the original lender could call it all back, call the money at one time. Okay, good. So think of it, the due on sale clause, the only time that your client needs to worry about this section is if they were going to do a lease option or a seller finance. If they're getting a loan, you really don't need to worry about this due on sale. So the due on sale is basically just saying in certain transactions, a lease option or a seller finance, it's possible the original lender gets wind of it and says, you can't do that. We want you to pay off the house right now. In which case, your buyer now would be in a scenario of potentially losing the house to that lender foreclosing on the home. Does that make sense? Okay. Any questions on page two?
Look at that. We did it in seven minutes. All right, page three. Authorizations. Uh, 14 is saying that uh, the TILA RESPA integrated disclosure. Now, here's the interesting thing on this. So you learned in school that you have, part of your fiduciary duty is you have to um, go to every closing or at least review the settlement statements. You learned that in school, right? So our state law says you need to go review seller, the settlement statements are now closed, called closing disclosure. Yet there's a federal law that says you don't have a right to do that. So a state law says you have to do it, and a federal law says you have, don't have a right to do it. So what do we do? Civil war. Yeah, civil war. So <laughs> section 14 actually gives, per, we're just getting permission now to override the federal law that says you, you don't have a right to know what's going on with your claim. Okay? So, in the event the title company or somebody were to say, I can't send you a copy, send them a copy of this saying, this, my client has given me permission to do it. Okay? I don't think you'll run into that, but just if you did. Every, every now and then you'll get a title company that says, I can't give you a copy of that. Okay, great. Here's this. All right, section 15 says this is the entire agreement. There's not anything that's not dis uh, disclosed here, and the, it's all in writing. So then they're going to sign. You're going to sign, and you are authorized to sign on behalf of the company. So always look on the document. If it says, like this one, a signature of authorized buyer's agent or broker, you can sign it. Some of them will say it has to be signed by a branch broker, then get one of the brokers to sign it. If it says by the principal broker, then that has to be our principal broker signing it, to, which is Matt Barton. But does Rob sometimes sign a render? He looks like uh bring it to me. Bring it to Andrew. He'll get that signature. There you go. All right. Now before you flip the page, what does it say in red? Hopefully yours is in red. On there. Do you have a real estate need outside of our state? Which means what? Why would we put that on here? Reload plug. <laughs> That's right. So that is the reminder for you. Don't forget, just because this person is coming as a buyer, don't forget to find out. Just because you have somebody moving from Minnesota to here, ask them, do you have a property to sell there? If they do, you can send it through our relocation department as an outgoing referral. The average commission is $1,000 on that for just asking this one question. Yeah, so make sure you ask the question. Because... It's like $1,000 for a less than an hour worth of your time. Like $1,000 an hour is pretty good money, right? All right, now flip the page. All right, next is the buyer due diligence checklist. This is probably, here's what I would say about the buyer due diligence checklist. This is your, as an agent, this is your get out of jail free card. Like, so don't forget this form. What I mean by that is, in the event that one of your clients tries to sue you, this is going to be the form that more than likely is going to get you off the hook because it's tied to that section that I said, this says don't trust anything I tell you. This is just an expansion of that paragraph. And so what this is saying, if you look in there, the notice from the company, buyer is advised that the company and its agents are trained in the marketing of real estate. Neither the company nor its agents are trained or licensed to provide the buyer with professional advice regarding the physical condition or regarding legal or tax matters. And then it has, here are some examples. So here's how you, I explain this to the client. As I say, this buyer due diligence form is saying, I'm not the expert. These things that are in bold on these next three pages are some ideas of things you might want to check out. So what you want to do is you want to be telling the client, like, this is not all inclusive, but these are some ideas of what most people will research when buying a property. Does that make sense? So this form, and we have them then, so flip through to page three of that. So on the end there, there's a receipt and acknowledgement by the buyer. They are acknowledging that they understand that you're not the expert. They should check with these other areas to find out. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, yeah, go ahead. So are they just signing that they received this or that they actually did the work? Great question. All This is just an acknowledgement that you've told them 
that they should check these things out, not rely on you. Yeah, great question. So all they're, they're signing is that you told them they can check out and find there are professionals and you're not it, basically. Okay? But just for an extra layer of protection, the next form, the next page in there, is the receipt and acknowledgement of buyer due diligence. Now, what we found is it is normal for Andy, I'm just kidding, agents, to send the documents via dot loop or DocuSign and they sign it. Now, how much time do your clients really stop and read all of that stuff? Or tell the truth, what do they do? They just go click, 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 and it's back to you, right? So because of that, and even actually before all of that, what would happen though is even when we were getting actual signatures, the client would come back and say, well, I didn't know I signed that. I didn't realize that I signed a form saying that, that I couldn't rely on you. And so they would then try to sue us that way. So then we came up with this form, this receipt and acknowledgement of buyer due diligence form. So the idea of this form is just an extra layer of protection where we're actually going to have them initial next to, I hereby understand and acknowledge of my rights to have a home inspection performed by a professional home inspector that I can get a home warranty, that I should do mold inspection, radon test. Like we're having them in individually initial next to each one of those, which again, in the event you end up in court, you've got first the buyer due diligence of them saying, us saying, you signed this, that you agreed to that. But in addition to that, we had you initial next to every one of these things, which is like when you look at the buyer due diligence, that's like a lot to read. But when you look at the home inspection, for them to read, I hereby understand and acknowledge of my rights to have a home inspection by a professional home inspector. Like, it's less likely for them to convince a judge, well, I didn't read that one sentence there. Like, you could get away a little bit with, well, look at all this information. I wasn't going to read all that. Well, this, you had to initial next to each one of these things. So it's just an extra layer of protection for you. Does that make sense? All right. So you put the property address, MLS number, and buyer sign. Next page. Do you have them fill that out with every house that you look at, or just when they make an offer? Good question. Yeah. That's interesting. MLS yeah. Number. I was gonna. So for me personally, I would say do the due diligence right off the bat. But this one again, you probably could get away. Andrew, do you know so Andrew's over all the TCs? Are they looking for this on every pro the, the actual property at the bottom, or are they only looking that we have the form? Just that they have it. So, but I guess I would say though the fact that we have it on here, again, for the extra layer of protection, I would say it would be a good thing to do it for every property they write an offer on. I would do this because again, if they came back and tried to say oh, I didn't know, and you were like, well, we wrote three offers and you signed this form three times, like. Every layer of that, a judge is going to be less likely to be like, you. they made you sign it three times, Andy, and you're saying you had no idea. So you're saying that maybe this would be with the REPSI when you're doing a REPSI? Or I wouldn't send it with the REPSI. No, no, I said when you have a client. client. I would have to tell you, we're going to write an offer in this house. You like this house, write an offer. In addition to that, remember that buyer? I include the this, well, we, this is a little more detailed. Remember, we have a, maybe it's like a refresher. Like you said, you had them a couple months. They don't might remember. Remember, we have an opportunity. You have an opportunity to don't trust the word I say. Yep. Love it. Okay. All right. Good. Great question. Anything else on that form? Now I'm going too fast. All right. Next. You guys won't be playing with me. No. <laughs> Thanks. No. I get nothing from that. I said you wouldn't complain if we get done a few minutes early, would you? And you all just stared at me. You want the whole. You want the whole. All right, well, let's go back to page one, then, because i got a few more things to share. Whoa, 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 Russ. Let me stop you right here. <laughs> Parker, okay. All right, so confirmation of earnest money received. Now, it used to be that our real estate purchase contract had a section right up there. Remember how much time Rob spent on the earnest money last week? <laughs> Andrew, yes. There used to be a section there that we would sign that we had received the earnest money. The problem with that was agents would check the box that says they're going to get it four days afterwards, and then they would then go get this whole contract all signed, they would collect the earnest money, and then they would go have their clients sign the REPSI that they had received the earnest money. 
Is there a problem with that? Or let me rephrase that. There's a problem with that. What is the problem? What's the problem with that? What? Yeah, you're now altering an executed contract. You've come to an agreement with the buyer and the seller. They've agreed to this contract, and then agents were going back and signing, hey, I've received the earnest money now. So they were signing it after we already had a fully executed contract. They're altering a fully executed contract was the problem. So the division said, let's wipe that out. And instead of that, now we have this confirmation of earnest money received. So when do we have this signed? And who signs it? The person who receives it. Yeah, whoever's receiving the earnest money. Good. So you're going to fill this out, put in the buyer, the buyer's agent, brokerage, seller, seller's agent, brokerage, property address, all that, and then check the box, whichever applies. Is it a direct wire into our triple? We don't do that. Why do we have it? Oh, because this is a division for the UAR formula. So don't do that. We don't want a wire. If we have a buyer that's doing it, uh, typically, you still will do the earnest money. But so a better example would be like a VA loan. Yes, typically people will still do an earnest money just because it makes the seller feel better about it, and then they'll get the earnest money back at closing. So they still have to get the money. You, have to like you don't have to. You could. Yeah, you could. But typically, you still want to because if, if, if most sellers get it and see zero and they go, ah, oh, like. Five hundred the best, like for a VA. on a VA, if it would, or something like that. Yeah, I would say do five hundred or thousand something. Like I will say, like, because uh, I had that happen. My we had a VA loan, and our first time we did it, they our agent didn't. That was never even a thing. And the second time we bought a house, they were like, "Oh yeah, here's your thousand and we had no idea. Like, so we were blindsided. <laughs> had no clue that it was going to happen. So now that I'm an agent, it's something that I'm going to make sure if I'm dealing with VA that I tell them up front. Because the lender had told us that we didn't have to put anything down. And we had it. It was fine. It was just like, what do you want this money from? So uh, now that you brought that up, that's something that I'm like personally going to make sure because I just didn't know. Cool. Yes, good questions. Anything else on confirmation of earnest money? All right. Next page. Right. That signature at the bottom, uh, that's our signature or whoever's receiving the earnest money. Yeah. So, Andrew, do we when we when they just come drop it off with Graham, does she just sign these? No, she'll have a broker sign it. Okay. So, yeah, but, so whoever's receiving it. can sign yes, this. Yes. You should. Like, if yeah. your client gives you a check, you should sign this. Yeah. It doesn't require a broker signature. Right. right. You're just saying that because when they bring it to the staff, we don't want the staff basically being responsible right. for that earnest money. All right, good. Anything else on earnest money? Next page. Limited agency consent form. When do we use this? The moment we're doing both sides. Both sides, or, or, or you've got the listing and I've got the buyer. And we're both working with Century Twenty One. Okay, good. So let me ask you a question. Anybody from Centerville in here? The Centerville office. Okay, good. So let's say you were showing a property up in Ogden. There's another Century 21 up there still, right? Yeah. So, and what is it for? Bushnell. Who? Bushnell. Bushnell. Okay. So you go to show a property that's listed by Century 21 Bushnell, and do you need this form? No. You're going to write an offer. Do you need this form? No. Why? It's not the same broker. broker. That's right. So that's the key. Any property, so think of it this way. Any property that you are going to represent, either the buyer or the seller or both, if both brokerages are Century 21 Everest, we need this. So if one of the brokerages was Century 21, whatever Bush he said, Bush League, then just kidding. Then you would not need this one. But is there one in Orem too? In other words, yeah, Harmon. Oh yeah, Harmon. Harman, that's right. Yeah, I got a funny story about them actually, but we don't have time. What? I know. I'm not. Gonna, I'm not going to Andrew. Chill out. But if you want to hear the story, remind me one of the classes, and I'll tell you. Anyway, um, so we use it if both if both sides, both brokerages, the one representing the buyer and the seller, is Century Twenty One Everest. You need this. Make sense? Okay. On the back side of that page, though, there's a spot that you're going to check either one agent or two. So if I'm representing both the buyer and the seller, it's one agent. 
But if using what Andy said, he's representing the seller and I have the buyer, it's going to be two agents, then the buyer and seller each sign. So in the scenario that Andy's representing the seller and I'm representing the buyer, who's signing on behalf of the company? Andy or me? Or both? Or a broker. That could work too. So either one, doesn't matter. Notice there's a spot for one. Only one of us has to authorize on behalf of the company. Does that make sense? So we both don't need to sign. Either he could or I could, and it doesn't really matter who signed. Okay? So probably I would say if I'm the buyer's agent filling it out and I'm going to check the two agents, I would have my buyer sign it, I would sign it, and then I would send it to Andy. He would take it to his seller, have them sign it. He doesn't need to sign it. Okay. All right, any questions on limited agency? We'll, we'll talk more about limited agency on Thursday, too. All right, next, disclosure and acknowledgement regarding lead-based paint. When do we need this? So if the home was built in 1978, do I need this form? No. Yes. I do not. Prior to. Prior to 1978. Would it hurt to do it? In fact, I used to do a lot of REO properties, foreclosures for the, the banks. The banks will do this on every property. Even if it was built last year, they would still use this form. So it's not going to hurt to use it, but the law is prior to 1978. Now, the way you can always know is on the MLS, the date you're built, if it is a blue link, you need this. And in fact, you click on the link, you have to upload it as part of your listing, which we'll talk more about on Thursday. So, and they'll have it on the bottom. <coughs> on the MLS. Yeah. Like attachments. And like if it was built before, then they'll just have it already signed by the seller on there. Yeah, perfect. They should have it. Should. Yeah. Good. All right. So filling this form out, you're going to put the address of the property at the top. Section two is where the seller is going to initial. Actually, I'm going to hold off. We'll talk about the seller on Thursday since we'll, that'll be seller packet. On the buyer side, though, your buyer is going to initial 3A that they've received copies of any information up in section two, which we'll talk about on Thursday. 3B, which says that they have received the protect your family from lead in your home. I would be willing to bet if we were to survey and audit all of the transactions that take place in the last year that were built prior to 1978, there's a lead-based paint disclosure, that is initialed by the buyers. And I'll bet you if you went to the buyer and said, did you really get the protect your family from lead? Rick, how often do you think that people really can happen? Are our TCs automatically sending that? Do you know? They should be. We should check that because I would be willing to bet we're not. And that if it is built prior to, they should we should share it with them in dot loop. I think I believe we ought to check that because that could come That's back. That's a great question. To, I would be willing to bet it's not happening. Do we do we physically hand it to them? Well, you could send it to them in dot loop, which is what I was saying to Andrew. Is, is RTCs if they're not after today, Andrew will make sure they are on one and they see this sending sharing it with them. So you don't have to physically. You could email it to them or something, but. Yeah, but they're initialing that they have received that form, so well, which essentially nice. just says don't eat lead paint. Well, it'd be nice if it was in dot lead too, because that's just additional thing. Like if it's in our loop, that's right. We know we sent it. If it's in our loop, we know that. Uh, yeah, you got it. Cool. All right, three C. They're going to initial that they've read the warning statement up in section one there, and then they're going to initial three D one or two that they're either going to take an opportunity to test for lead-based paint or they're going to waive their opportunity to test for lead-based paint. And they're initialing one or the other. A lot of times I will see agents have their clients initial both, in which case if you initial both, we're going to assume that they are initial 3D1, which what else do we need? What does it say in bold that we need if they do that? Lead-based paint identity. Then we also, in addition to the disclosure, need the addendum. Now, that gets confusing for agents. Which one is required if it's built prior to 1978? The disclosures. When is the addendum required? The initial Only if they initial 3D1. So if they don't initial 3D1, we don't need the addendum. If they do, we need the addendum. So I see a lot of times agents will initial have their client initial both, in which case now we need the addendum too. All right. 
No. Yeah, but it's common for the agent to make. The it's common for the agent to make the mistake and not include the addendum. So, all right. Section four is where the listing agent, which we'll talk about on Thursday, and then the buyers are going to sign and you're going to sign. So both agents get assigned, both buyers, both sellers. What if there's more than two buyers or more than two sellers? Yeah, great question. So if you were using like a dot loop or something, just drop another signature. If you're not, if I was sitting down with them, and there were three sellers, I would just have them. Fit it in there. So, yep, good question. All right, any other questions on lead based paint? All right, last page. Your favorite page. Most important, Most important one is your commission report. This is how you get paid. So, um, you're going to fill this out for every one of your closings, and you're going to start and just basically property address, put it in buyer, seller, title company. The, the, the where it says transaction type and it has residential slash buying on the actual form itself which is on an Excel spreadsheet you can click that so you could change it to commercial if it was commercial but most of the time you're just gonna leave it then you're gonna go down to put in the closing selling price and then you're gonna click on where it says gross and either change it to net leave it as gross or change it to flat amount whichever it is so how do you know if it's gross or net yeah, look at the MLS and it'll either say gross or net. So if it says gross, leave it as gross. If it's net, change it to net. Do 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 I need to explain the difference? Does anybody not know, want to know? What's more common to use? So gross is typically and what my recommendation is do gross. You're getting more heat. Yeah. No, should, not so as an agent, we should be looking for that though when we're looking at it. Yeah, because what here's the difference. If it says gross, you're getting paid off of the four hundred thousand dollar purchase price. If it says net, you're getting paid minus the four hundred thousand minus the eight minus you know so minus twelve thousand so three eighty eight is what your commission will be based on. It's three eighty eight instead of four hundred. Does that make sense? All right, then whatever the commission percentage is on. A real quick question. So if you have if you're a listing agent and you put a net price. Is both sides of the commission based on the net price or just like the buyer's agency? Uh, good question. You could do it in really probably either way. I would say typically if people put net, they do it both sides generally. Well, both the agreement with the property have. just for the given commission of 6 7% is based on that purchase price. Yeah. That's the, the agreement that was made in the listing. Is a net or a gross? So if we are ever if we wait wait so if, if we had a buyer who's going to take all these things off and you know buyers going to come think oh this something you want to give them a net commission you can't give them a net commission then gross commission for no, you our could. Side, or you could you could I'm just saying yeah I'm just saying typically I think most agents do net on both sides but you could do you just could. net on theirs and gross on yours but you better have it written out in the listing agreement okay. So good question. So then the commission percentage, that next one you're going to put in whatever it says on the MLS or whatever you agree to. And then the commission to the outside referral company. So if you were paying a referral to somebody else outside of our company, you would change that from none to yes and then put in who it is. It'll open a new box that you would type in. Enter. Okay, so you raise some money, add title, send them escrow instructions, then you will have to pay the franchise fee for the agent you serve. There you go. What? So, yeah, so if we receive a ten thousand dollar check and you're sending twenty five percent to somebody, and we receive ten thousand dollars, we have to pay a franchise fee on that, even if you're not receiving all that money. So you send an escrow instructions to the title company, you pay you seven five hundred, and then twenty five hundred, then you have to pay the six percent franchise fee on their money. Does that make sense? No. I'm just trying to. No. Okay. <laughs> Just remember to ask. If you were going to pay a twenty-five percent, let's say ten thousand or not ten thousand, twenty-five hundred dollars to some agent in California, that way. Um, what he's saying is, if you have them just send that money there, you're not going to pay. You're going to pay the franchise fee of seven percent or whatever on that gross commission to Century Twenty One. To help fund all the advertising and stuff that they do for the company, Does that makes sense. Because we have a contract that says we will pay a franchise fee of X amount on every dollar received. Yeah, so we're receiving money even though you're sending it somewhere else. So sell title, 
Because otherwise it comes and then we end up paying, you end up paying the franchise fee on that $2,500. So you, basically what he's saying is you'll make less money if you have it come here. If you have it go straight to there, you'll keep more money. That's all you really need to know, right? Well, uh, well I mean, because uh, we had to take uh, a referral fee to someone on a live transaction, and I think the TC's made us do it through the office. So, like, the title company wouldn't send a check directly because you have to get that whole commission agreement form signed by our broker and their broker, so it's sort of added into the loop so that it comes out. So I'm just wondering. So that was nice of Andrew to listen to your question. Yeah, since he's over all the TCs. Very important. Because I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> and I totally lost control. I kept it for an hour and 55 minutes. And it depends if it's internal or if it's a... If it's an external, we're going to pay a, a realty executives of Arizona. It's going to go out through the title company. And that's It can't be so, done that way. If it's internal, it's coming through our relocation center. Those will be paid according to that relocation piece. So there is a difference, and it's a good question, but it's it's where the point of origin is, because it's our relocation center. They're going to handle that piece through the relocation center, so it's not going to matter much. Because you're not going to. It's not. If it's not, if it's just a referral, that we <laughs> have a referral. If it's a referral, make sure we title. Because, like he says, you don't want to get hit with the franchise fee on top of that. So, but I would say talk to Andrew afterwards because he's saying that they had one and the TCs made him bring it here. So I would talk to him. All right, next commission advance company used. Just leave that as no. Don't do commission advance. Next, Century Twenty One admin fee collected. So that's whatever. Remember on the front page we had two ninety five. If you were collecting a three ninety five or a four ninety five or whatever, you'll change that in there. Earnest money held by Century Twenty One Everest. If we're holding the earnest money, you'll put in whatever the amount is. If we're not, like if it was being held at a title company or something, just leave it at zero. Agent credits given at title, again, don't. But if for some reason you did, you'd put in an amount there. Meaning like sometimes there might be something that's going on and it's like there's $100 that needs to be and an agent will go, we'll take it out of my commission. Then they will do that at title. You would put it in right there, $100 that you gave up. Okay. All right, so then that will total up what the title check should be when we get it from the title company, and which will be the amount that we receive. Then the commission to the agent, here's how the splits are done. Now, here's the good news. If you're using a TC, you don't have to do any of this. If you're not using a TC, you do. So use a TC. <laughs> I have a question. Yes. Um, so on the admin fee, if I was to put a 395 instead of 295, will it show that that comes to me? Yes, on your split. Yep. Yep. Anything above the 295, which I'll show you where that plays out. So then down here under the commission to the agent, it's uh, is it a single agent or if you're on a team? If you're on a team and you're filling it out, which if you're on a team, most of the time you're not filling it out. So like you're on Austin's team, right? So he'll somebody else will fill this okay. out. Thank you. But you would click the button there, do a team, and then it will open up a new box of who's the team are you on and all that. You you probably have somebody does that on Phil's too. Yeah. yeah. So um, you'll put in your name there, if it's the single agent, and then right here's where it's going to deduct the 295. So if you had done a 395, the other 100 now is going to drop down into the, the commission area. And then the agent to then calculate, here's what your agent base is, so the gross commission is, then what split are you on? So this one is assuming you're on a 70-30, which I had written on the board. So you're getting 70, the company's getting 30%. And then it calculates that admin fee, and then it's going to then have uh, the admin fee pay, paid by the agent, whatever it is, if there is one. And then you can donate to our foundation. So we have a foundation that is set up to give back to the community, basically. So the recommendation is to donate $21, Century 21, but you can change it whatever you want. Um, if you're using a transaction coordinator, there's where you would put in the 295 for using them and who it is. And then, bam, it calculates what your commission check will be. And do you want it direct deposited? No or yes. And that's it. I did it with 20 seconds to spare. Wow, nice work. <laughs> Usually people are standing when they do that. Anyway. <laughs> okay. Thank you for being here. So what we will do, unless you have questions, any questions? Um, I think you
you, I know you were saying like the buyer's contract so that you have permission to do the settlement papers. Uh -huh. Who gives you that? Or do you have to ask for it? Oh, no, the title company will give you a copy of the closing disclosures oh, okay. before, yeah. So before, it, before, they, before your client goes to closing. Or, and sometimes when they show up to close them. Make sure the or settle them. Who use forms through the MLS? Oh, good question. Actually, that is an excellent question. Let me tell you, I would highly recommend you use the Century 21 forms. And in fact, who was it we were just talking to? I want to say it might have been Justin. Might not have been. Um, anyway, we just had an agent who, no, it wasn't Justin. They listed a property, it expired, somebody else relisted the home, but somebody that looked at it while the home was listed by us made an offer, but two days after our listing expired and they relisted with somebody else. And the agent said, who gets the commission on that? So well, let me ask you guys. Who would get the commission on that? Well, that should be the original listing. So the question that became that I asked was, did you use the Century 21 listing agreement or did you use the MLS listing agreement? And he said, I always use, oh, I know who it was. It wasn't Justin. I always use the MLS. I said, well, here's the problem with that. The MLS agreement says that under that protection period, you're protected unless they've relisted with somebody else. So because of that, who gets the commission? The new agent. Had they used our form? Ours doesn't say that. Ours says if somebody buys it that looked at it during the terms of ours during that protection period, we're still owed the commission. Now. Collecting it might be a different story, but technically we are entitled to it. So I would highly recommend use the Century 21 Everest form because we put in a few things that protect us a little bit better than the MLS. So, good question. Okay, well thank you for being here. And uh, Thursday we'll do the seller paperwork and I'll shoot out an email to everyone that needs to be here, so like I did yesterday. So. Although if you haven't been to it, you need to be here. Right, Timber? Correct. Whatever you said is right. <laughs> okay, thanks for being here. It's always right. I'm surprised you're going to say the closing prayer. Everyone was so quiet, it sounded like you were going to have a closing prayer.